So hi everyone, this is your student talks and uh, I am Marlene. As you perhaps know, every year at the 10th of October is observed as World Mental Health Day. And the aim of the day is to raise awareness of mental health issues and mobilize efforts in support of mental health. So that's why we decided that uh, this month your student talks will be dedicated to this topic as well. And uh, I have invited here Emily McPherson from European Students' Union. So first of all, maybe uh, Emily, I will give the word to you and you can say a bit about ESO. Thank you so much, Marlene. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here with, with us today. Um, yeah, so the European Students' Union represents around 20 million students from all across the European higher education area. We have 45 different national unions in 40 different countries and also several member associate member unions who are uh, interest-based organizations, so medical students union, psychological students union, etc., that are cover in Europe as well. And we represent all of these students on a European level up towards the Bologna follow-up group, the European Union, UNESCO and the Council of Europe on everything related to uh, the student life and student experience and all their their rights. Okay, thank you, Emily, for this overview about the European Students Union. Um, I will uh, uh, I will introduce Emily as our speaker and uh, why exactly Emily has been invited to this webinar today. Um, Emily is the Equality Coordinator uh, for the European Students' Union, and she is originally from the United Kingdom, but has spent most of her life in Norway. Uh, Emily received a Bachelor of Sciences degree in Sports and Exercise Science with Biological Science from Oxford Brookes University. She has studied Music Business Management and is currently on leave from a master's degree in Exercise Physiology at Norway University of Applied Sciences. Emily has Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder and besides her studies, she is a disability activist, a rights activist and has an intersectional approach to her activism. Uh, with her lived experiences and research into disability and society, she fights for equal access and rights in both education and the wider world. Emily has been actively involved in all aspects of student life in both countries, including sports, societies and student representation at local, national and European level. So uh, once again, thank you, Emily, for joining us. Thanks that you agreed to be our speaker today. Thank you so much, Malia. Yeah, I think I won't uh, do any longer intro. We can uh, already start with our main part of the webinar. I'm just informing our listeners that today we won't have any presentation or a slideshow to show to you, but rather it will be a free flowing conversation between Emily, me, and hopefully you as well. And I'm also saying already, Apologies in advance if you can hear any construction noise when I am speaking. I'm sorry about that. There is something going on behind my wall and I can't unfortunately do anything about it, but I hope it won't be too much disturbance. But anyway, uh, let's start. Um, ESO, ESO's activities, uh, current situation about mental health. Uh, where I would like to start our conversation today is actually uh, from year 2020. Uh, I know, Emily, that ESU put together and published a mental health charter in 2020. Can you tell a bit more uh, why ESU decided to publish that kind of policy document and what were the reasons behind that? I think so. I mean, rewind back to 2020, you know, we can all remember lockdown and COVID. I mean, it, it feels a bit distant now, but it really highlighted the student situation and students' mental health. Um, a lot more students reported on loneliness and it became a more widespread issue that they were, was more known because before then it's something that we as a student movement have been talking about and working on for years, 
but now more and more people were made aware of it. Um, so that's why we carried out some research that we'll come back to later. And then we created this mental health charter to set out our expectations for our, our student life and relating to mental health. Oh, you're muted, Marlon. <laughs> yes, sorry. Uh, I just said that I think it's a very nice initiative that you came up with. Um, I have had a look on the document and um, I'm just wondering, like you had a lot of, uh, or we can't say a lot of aims, but you had certain aims that you, or the fields uh, that you were, that you wanted to improve um, about mental health and uh, especially students' mental health. Uh, when you think back now, uh, what do you think, what has in general changed in those three years? Well, I mean, I'll think of the positive things in that at first. So, I mean, a lot of students were lonely and wanted to be back on campus. At that time, many of them were, were stuck at home in small student flats, weren't able to interact with their peers or family, were stuck in a lone and new city and were reporting on a lot of loneliness. Um, the students are, are now back on campus. And for, for most students, that's a really, really positive thing. And they were speaking about mental health more and more. I think there is more awareness of mental health and it's more, there's less stigma attached to it and we're talking about it more and more. Um, the most positive thing, one of the things that we have in our charter is about data collection. And that's something that your student have given us and we look forward to seeing the publication in the spring on how the mental health is that's a new topical module that your students covered but otherwise i don't think student meant students mental health has changed that much unfortunately um we've seen several wars students are worried about the environment there's inflation they're worrying about the cost of living and all of all of these things and it's, it feels a bit even more precarious. It, at that time, it felt like we were going through it together. So even though lots of people are struggling, we you weren't as alone. Whereas now, it's 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 really 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 tough. I think. Um, and we've looked at different countries I've spoken to. So in Scotland, they have got um, they've won a big win. They've managed to get counsellors on their campus um, and they've got about 3.21 million pounds to save their counsellors <clears throat> there's um the, that's a that's a positive thing that they're working on but there's still a lot to be done I think <clears throat> sorry <clears throat> yes I can imagine that yeah when we had the pandemic uh, going on it was really difficult it was new to us, the situation, but on the other hand, at the moment, we have so many different challenges at one time. War going on in different countries, um, environment issues that young people are especially worrying about, and also uh, the cost of living that is rising all the time. Indeed, but um, in the charter, you have three different subtopics that you were focusing on, environment, uh, support services, and systematic change. Maybe you can uh, explain a bit uh, what were those different, e different areas consisting of in the charter, and also maybe you can reflect uh, where have you achieved the most, where you can see the most developments. Yeah, so the first chapter is about the learning environment, the higher education environment. So both the physical space, I mean, I'm no interior art architect or um, there are psychologists that deal with this sort of thing as well, that, you know, making sure that the spaces that students are learning in are positive for their mental health, um, but also the digital learning spaces um, and, making sure that they have roofs over their heads because, I mean, you can't study if you don't have a safe and, and good place to live. And that becomes part of the learning environment. 
including talking about making sure that there are the safe spaces, there are quiet rooms, prayer and meditation rooms so that when you're at your place of study that if you need to use those spaces, they're available to you. Another basic need that is covered here is um, food and nutrition, making sure that you know you can afford uh, decent meals or that your university um, provides a decent meal. And there are some countries where, like Finland and Slovenia, where they have subsidized student meals, and it's making sure that that's available and making sure that there is space for um, groups to meet up, um, to do physical activity, because those are really, really good preventative measures because meeting each other and moving has a really, really positive effect and being a part, part of an interest group of something that you enjoy means that you make friends and you have more, more of a sense of belonging. It's also about making sure that the curriculum is inclusive and that it takes into account a student-centered learning approach and making sure that it supports students and that if they need to have more flexibility around assessments or learning because of <clears throat> preventative measures, but also if they become ill, then they can, they can adapt their learning and have different learning pathways. When it comes to the, the support services, it's making sure that the teaching staff know where to signpost students and that there is counsellors available on campus um, and that they are free and that they're easily accessible and that there isn't any discrimination um, to make sure that everyone feels comfortable going and it's not that you have a crisis on a Tuesday afternoon and you have to wait 10, 12 weeks to speak to someone because that can, you know, we know how the academic year works. You don't have time to take time out. Some things need to be solved there and then. And it's about, you know, promotion and talking about mental health. We're much better about that because that helps prevent it and making sure that it's okay to talk about whether you're having suicidal thoughts at the worst and making sure that realizing that, you know, they're just thoughts and, but also just talking about that it is, everyone has mental health. Um, it's, it can be good some days, it can be bad. And it's making, it's normalizing that and talking about it in a better way. And then, yeah, the last chapter is about the systematic change and there we go back to the slogan of the disability movement, nothing about us without us. It should be a topic that's serious by all stakeholders from the institutions to NGOs to the government and making sure that the policy that is created includes all the stakeholders and make sure that we really have good policies in place. And then onto the data collection that we're really pleased that you're a student are doing as one of the biggest um, data collections in social dimension in Europe. But it's more of that having national data as well to see how, how students in your country are, are doing so then that you can implement and you know make targeted approaches to making sure, you know, seeing how, how your students are doing. So it's really like thinking holistically about every aspect of, of student life. Yeah, I think that's... Yeah, but if you think about those three subtopics or areas, uh, what would you what you say? Are there differences in that sense that are change uh, more difficult to achieve in one field than in other? Or you haven't like perceived it when you're doing your your, your job in ESO. Oh well, yeah, my job in ESO is a lot of a lot being up towards Europe. We have our members that are working on this in different countries, and and like I mentioned, like in Scotland, they they managed to get funding for for counsellors. Um, in Belgium, they're still they're working on it, and they've just collected a load of 
um, really good data from the Flemish Student Union, um, where they've unfortunately about 46% of students screen positively for one or more mental health problems. And it's a similar sort of numbers in, in Norway they have. They also are talking a lot about mental health problems um, and every third student has a mental illness. There was a study published in the Lancet a couple of weeks ago on the student health and wellbeing data. So we're getting more and more data collection from the countries. The same our Italian student union. They also carried out a survey with 30,000 respondents and 57% of them have experienced loneliness. Um, 28% of them have self-harmed. And so in Italy, they're really working to get the councillors on campus, but at the moment it's being blocked by the government. So it is being talked more and more about in our different unions um, more than maybe it was before, but it's, it's making sure that we have long-term funding. A lot of countries brought in funding during the pandemic, but then haven't, haven't followed up. A positive thing we've seen on the European level is the EU have launched their comprehensive approach to mental health. So it's making sure that every aspect of life, that, that mental health is thought about and everything. The one comment we had to that was that students weren't included. They talked a lot about young people and youth, but we've seen that students are a particular group that are more susceptible to mental health. Last week, there was a study done by King's College in London that, that, that showed this, and um, they've had a huge increase in students, that the rate in which they um, experience mental health problems, and the 18 and 19-year-olds there were more likely to have mental health problems than, than their age-matched peers. So there is some movement happening, but it's not happening fast enough. We need more funding um, for and, and better policies in place everywhere. Yes, I can imagine that when we compare the area of uh, uh, supporting environment and support services and then the systematic change, then probably the systematic change is the most difficult or at least time demanding to achieve because first of all, it's about raising awareness, but once it's done, it still takes time to really to have the change mm -hmm. because you have to put all those services in place uh, and it takes time to establish the system, I think. I think there are some things that, you know, we can also do that don't cost a lot, you know, making sure that there are spaces on campus for students to meet each other, you know, so that there are there are these groups that students themselves can, can lead and they can be from anything from, you know, cake societies to Taylor Swift societies to to football clubs you know those those are really important things as well and and they don't have to cost a lot of money and it's something that is already being being done uh, as well <clears throat> and then moving on to the treatment and getting you know having the counselors then the funding for that yeah sometimes tiny things help as well at least for for the prevention or creating the supporting environment. But I'm wondering if anyone from our audience has any questions or comments, like you can put them in the chat. You can also just unmute yourself, raise hand, let us know that you would like to ask Emily about something. Yeah, we're really here for anything. It's not so formal. We are today having kind of free conversation not a presentation in that sense so in any time if you have any questions or comments just let us know either via chat or raising your hand and asking yourself it's a real euro student talks it's a the yeah. talk part being the exactly <laughs> uh, but if at the moment not um i would like to move on to the survey that as conducted about mental health as far as I know, it was conducted during the uh, pandemic and it was published in 2022. So maybe you would like to cover it a bit more. I know that it's a comparative analysis of mental health among higher education students. And it was through National Union's perspective, am I right? 
Yeah. So we asked our unions different questions relating to, you know, is, is are they working on the topic? Is it something that the higher education institutions are working on? Is it something that their governments are working on? And, and how are they they working on it? And um, it was done, the first round was done in 20, spring 2020, <clears throat> excuse me. And then we did a follow-up in, in 2021 and, and most of our, our student unions uh, participated and really appreciate the, the work that was done back then by all the unions that were, were involved. And it was really on the background of the COVID-19 um, pandemic. Um, and the, it was made because before that there wasn't much research into students well-being and it wasn't didn't seem to be a concern and it hadn't been documented on a European uh, level and they found that you know as we've talked about there it increased in importance and more of a priority at all all the different levels um and it's more a priority of higher education institutions mainly within northern and western europe countries taking initiatives to break the stigma on mental health um and it helps us understand what's what's happened so there was there was lower that we looked at lots of different countries and like in a lot of the surveys that i've read it showed that there were lower levels of well-being by female students who had financial uh, problems students with mental health problems and students lacking appropriate study places um so that was that was one of the findings actually sorry that was from our other student stu study about student life during the COVID-19 um, pandemic but in the comparative one so for example it wasn't on the agenda of Romanian higher education institutions at the time talking about mental health um several of our national union of students said that there was laws around mental health services um and almost all of them or what all of our national unions of students were working on mental health at the time in in some capacity and it was a really important part of their agenda in their students union and it was also something that was very much that work it worked on on a, a local level as well um and many reported that it was at the time it was something that was very much being discussed um across europe in their higher education institutions in their countries you can see all the report it's on the ESU website it's called a comparative analysis of mental health among higher education students I just had to cheat and look down at it. Uh, yes, I was wondering, uh, as you said, it was the first time that you conducted a survey like that, but was there anything especially surprising or totally new to you that came out of that? Um, I think it was a really good way of our union sharing good practices, seeing that, you know, how they're working on it and, and sharing that it, there wasn't anything really surprising to me as I've been working on this for, for many, many years. Um, but, you know, a lot of them, are, several asked about the data collections and we're really glad that we've we've got that. Um, so it, it, it was more that to show, have something to show that, you know, the different higher education institutions and governments what was going on elsewhere in Europe and that we we all that the different NUSs want it to be the same as in other countries it's just a, a really good document for them to use uh, yeah I think it's always good that, that even if it's especially not so surprising or totally new you still have a certain document to survey to to refer to where it's all like summarized together um, but as I mentioned before the stu this uh, study was uh, published in the beginning of 2022 I think uh, when you look back um, is there any 
developments, some changes that has happened after that. What do you think? How do you feel when you are uh, communicating with your colleagues from other student unions in Europe? Um, how has the situation developed after that? How do you see it? I think some places, yeah, for the worse, some for the better, and it's you know it's something that we continuously we still need to work on um, because we really need those systemic systemic changes. But uh, there's nothing else that I haven't already uh, mentioned. It's just about keeping on working on the topic and and raising awareness and you know supporting each other as and well supporting our members in in their work and sh having that space to to be able to share their experiences and continue that knowledge building <clears throat> oh you're muted again love <laughs> Yes, I have to mute myself because I know. Like, and then I, then I forget about it. Yeah, very, very professional moderating. No, but it, this is this is all a talk, so you know, it's, it's make sure that, that everyone else feels that you know comfortable that they yeah. can also get involved. I don't want to disturb everyone with the noise from the background. But anyways, um, as much as you communicate with your colleagues from other unions is there anything specific from certain countries that you would like to bring out maybe either based on the survey or later discussions maybe some very good examples good practices from other countries they have um we both highlighted good practice from outside of the nus's and i know that like a lot of nus's i mean the national unions are often working more lobbying their governments for things. Some have more contact with their students, um, but it's really, really like local student unions that are doing a lot of the work, you know, organizing breakfast clubs um, so that people can come together and eat. It's often a big theme in students, for students is gathering around food, but it's really important because we're really, really, you know, struggling financially and, you know, making sure that you have a good meal and meeting each other and chatting. Um, several of the NUSs um, spoke about different practices from other NGOs and other, uh, other associations. So Italy, they told us about associations that promote free counseling services um, are, um, one of our members from Finland, Seal, that represents the university students, because they have two organizations, one for university and one for applied sciences. They have an umbrella uh, organization that I'm not going to try and <laughs> pronounce because my Finnish isn't that good. <laughs> and they've been really, really helping pull the weight on parliamentary work as well and including mental health issues. In, in Ireland, um, USI, they have several initiatives and campaigns which they promote on the topic of mental health and higher education. They have a jigsaw peer education program workshop, spun out articles, Peter House and Samaritans with, who have a 24 hour helpline. Um, children help them, so a lot of different helplines that are open to, to everyone as well. And I really want to talk about um, Belgium because they have a really, really uh, great program that our, our Flemish um, member VVS told us about that's um, mood space. And they have collected, used the data that VVS collected and they have loads of resources available both in Dutch and in English. And that it's an initiative that's um, done by the Support Centre Inclusive Higher Education in collaborative with the the students academic experts and it's a it's a brilliant information library with all sorts of topics with self-help um and where to where to look for help and also tips and and really good stories from different people you know showing you that you're you're not alone in this and Austria, um, they've been working with the Medical Students Association and having a mental health awareness week. Um, 
Eol in Estonia. They are working with Valtec, um, which is the Estonia Mental Health and Wellbeing Co Corporation. So really all the way through, there are different initiatives all across Europe. Um, in Malta, they have been working with um, ADHD Malta and the Malta Autism Parents Association and lots of different NGOs working on mental health. So there are lots of different things. It's really important to like collaborate with others as well. You know, we're not working on this on our own. We are experts in the student experience and we have other people that work solely on mental health. So it's about finding our, our allies as well, I think. Definitely, and, and, and it's also about learning from others. So I also linked um, the survey uh, to the chat from SO webpage so everyone can look it up. Um, I think it's always important uh, bringing out those good practices as an inspiration for others because it's other for other student unions. They can maybe also start some campaigns at least or do something which maybe don't need so much funding sometimes and also for other higher education institutions in other countries that what could be the ways to even think if you don't have any measures in place at the moment in your country. It can be as easy as, you know, having a walk and talk group, you know, that doesn't cost anything, you know, let's meet at this time and explore the local area. That's, you know, there's a lot of mindfulness and that's it, you know, looking at the trees, talking to each other and being, you know, getting out in the fresh air and doing some exercise as well it it doesn't have to cost a lot yeah exactly i'm always thinking about either public or academic libraries that actually the role of libraries is quite uh, yeah. like underrated in that sense that uh, those places bring people together and maybe those could be the places that say that oh, after you have been studying here, maybe we can have a walk and talk talk tour or whatever. So you can find different, different uh, let's say, departments of higher education institutions even that could serve maybe different functions also for supporting mental health. I completely agree. I have experience with that. Like my, my uh, campus was really, really small and the librarian, they were worth their weight in gold and you know they they were there for all sorts of things whether it was practical help or just a chat the same with um the workers in the canteen um I talked a lot to them and they said how many students speak to them when they buy their food and they really like because they saw people regularly they you know follow their lives and check up on them and it's you know there's all these different parts of the the higher education community and they all have a really really valuable role to play and it's recognizing recognizing that indeed it reminds me some old ladies from our university's cloakroom when i was a student they were always talking to everyone being very nice and having some just like uh chat with some students but it was always very nice that someone was like welcoming you when you <laughs> came to the university and also on your way back maybe saying some nice words to you and it actually brings the warmth in the in the environment and I think we have, like, in, as individuals, you know, whether we're students or not, we also, you know, that's, it's all it takes sometimes is just to smile at someone in the street. Yeah, exactly. But I'm still wondering if anybody has questions to you, Emily, or comments about the study, if we didn't have them before about the charter, maybe, maybe about the survey. Or maybe you would like to share some experiences from your country. What have you been doing towards mental health? How is the situation about students' mental health? Yes, Anna, raise hand, please feel free. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you also, Emily, for sharing these very interesting results with us. Um, a question came up uh, to the things you said in the beginning about counseling, because um, that seems to be a very central um, element. Uh, in promoting student well-being and do you have any experience um, maybe about shifting the counseling to an online setting because in Austria it was quite an issue during the pandemic uh, to make these services available at higher education institutions um, remotely so mostly online 
and I just wanted to ask whether you uh, could share some insights or whether you know if this maybe is um, even better and um, has a lower threshold for people to reach out maybe if it's online. Thank you so much for a great question. And uh, yeah, I, I have personal experience in Norway. We also have, there's my institution inland Norway covered the whole of inland Norway, which is, it's a, a diffuse area but for, for people outside Norway, but it's a huge, huge um, region. And there we did use digital counselling and I think it's really useful to have them as, as supplements. There's there's a lot of things that you get out of being in person with someone, but it's having those as a supplement, whether it's a chat or whether it's a video call like this or a phone call. I think they're really, really good, good supplements. But I think the best thing is the in-person, obviously. Um, but yeah, there is there's a lot of there's a lot of good experiences with that as well. So something that I'm glad you asked about and that you consider. I hope that answers your question. Yes, I, I was wondering that it's, <clears throat> it always has its own pros and cons. I can imagine that if you have had the counseling already and you have to continue it online, it's easier. But if you have to start with a totally new counselor, maybe it's more difficult to start from scratch and do it like through a video call. Mm -hmm. But it depends on the person, I think. And also it's about how available is the good connection, even if you have space, maybe if you're living in a dorm and yeah. you, you have the counseling time online and actually you don't have a very private space to to really like, you know, an open way to talk about your mental health problems then it's an, another way, maybe a drawback, but it, the cases are so different, I can imagine. And I think, you you know, you've hit on some key things there that we noticed during the pandemic, you know, people, for example, like, yeah, living in, in places that weren't ideal, whether it was for learning and teaching, but also for, for counselling, because you don't have that privacy. And there are, you know, different aspects, maybe in your identity, a lot of LGBT students uh, said that they weren't didn't feel comfortable at home. This is I don't have research on this. Is just from speaking speaking to them, and then there's the yeah the issue of making sure that you have a good internet connection. And there's a lot of places that don't you know I have a lot of German colleagues where yeah after five o'clock in the afternoon the internet is a lot lot worse. Um, but again there are the pros of it. Like if there are lots of different students, students aren't just straight out of secondary education some are in different life situations and this maybe is a way to help them access it as well because it's more more flexible and it's more available where where they are and more yeah more accessible and it's it it, it, it can be done more free as well I think which is the most important thing yeah in that sense it's a kind of tailor-made um, solutions that should be offered. As you mentioned before, that different subgroups of student populations, for example, female students with financial situ uh, difficulties or something, they are experiencing the student life in a different way, maybe, and they have different problems. So mm -hmm. I think that the tailor-made solutions or how you can offer the support so that it's directly targeted to different subgroups of students, it's also quite quite a challenge I can imagine have you heard any feedback from other countries from student unions or any discussions about that um not about that but when you spoke about the financial issue that's you know that is the main thing that is worrying students is you know their financing and if we can improve you know student support so that students who are studying full-time are able to do that full-time and have the support to do that financially and without having to worry about you know buying food versus getting the bus um some students have reported on that um our union in the uk has done a lot of research and looked into that to you know making sure that students aren't reliant on on part-time jobs because the same study from King's College London 
saw there was an increase in the rate at which students experience mental health as they work more hours. Um, so you're spending more time working and you're not having that time to, you know, learn, which is what you're there to do, but also be a part of the academic community and feeling that belonging because you you simply can't because you're worrying about financing and that is the biggest worry. So if there's one thing to take away from today is, you know, governments need to make sure that there is sustainable funding for students to make sure that they can complete their their studies um, it's great for the students and it's great for society to yeah so it's to me it's a a no a no-brainer yeah it's about like the title of the webinar are students uh, surviving or thriving so in that sense the basic needs should yeah. cover without too much stress because a lot of the time we hear from from politicians oh in my you know we've always had to work and stuff but we've looked again and again like it was it, it is much worse than when you look at like our buying power versus where back back when a lot of them were, were studying it's it's a completely different world um and just because they did it doesn't mean that we should have to do it you know you want the best and you you know yes there is a value in learning and I mean sorry there is a value in having a part-time job if you choose to have a work job next to your studies but you shouldn't be completely um reliant on on your job and taking time away from valuable study time you know you have students they're expected to work you know 40 hours a week on their studies but and then they're working 40 hours a week in a job as well like it just doesn't go around you need time to eat sleep and you know you are allowed to have a social life and goodness forbid a holiday as well as a student um so yeah I see there's a question in the chat there is a question I can read it maybe it's easier for this way but um, actually the question is about stigmatization regarding mental health problems um does it still exist and uh, how much and has it decreased in time and is it connected with the COVID-19 pandemics as well? And did your study concentrate on this topic somehow, the topic of stigmatization? Yes, I can't remember exactly in detail, but it is something that is talked about and it it varies in different countries, you know, the stigma attached to mental health. I think, you know, I live in, in Norway and I've grown up in the UK. In those countries, you know, we're talking more and more about it in this part of Europe, but there are other parts of Europe where it's still a stigma and it still isn't it still isn't talked about as much. But even within countries, I think there are different groups that there is more stigma attached, you know, the highest cause of of death a young mon- young men is is suicide. And you know, that is a huge, huge problem. So it's about talking about the gender differences in it as well, you know a lot more females report but doesn't I, I'm not the scientist it's just my my thoughts on this you know and then we have to remember there's also um non-binary people and LGBT people that aren't necessarily even represented in, in these surveys and they face a whole other level of stigma you know and speaking out about other minority groups you know black and brown folks and the like the stigmas in their communities again it's you know it's not a community obviously I'm from so I can't speak on their behalf but it's about educating ourselves about these different communities and the stigma that we can that they face and you know being good allies as well and understanding different groups of people's um struggles that they face Yes, thank you. It's definitely worth thinking uh, how so often uh, those different reasons why people's mental health is bad or or even the stigmatization, it comes from many different areas of life, maybe, not only mental health. Um, are there any other questions or comments before I can slowly, slowly start wrapping it up? Um. Yes, there is one question in the chat. 
uh, someone is saying that Rachel is saying that uh, she's working uh, for University of Mental Health Advisors Network based in the UK. Uh, their members support students, students with mental health conditions in universities. They in include advisors and mental health mentors. And we also had something published about the challenges around supporting students with mental health conditions in the UK. So there is a material that has been shared in the chat. And I think it's highly appreciated that you are sharing. It's great. Fresh off the press yesterday. So thank you. Thank you for that. And thank you, Rachel, for sharing and, and being here with us so actively. Um, but uh, to move towards the end of the webinar slowly, uh, you already mentioned that politicians, uh, policymakers should think about um, how to prove that students will will survive financially so that they don't have to work so much and so on. But if you think about one thing that um, you as a student representative from the European Student Union for the whole European level, uh, one thing that national policymakers should do uh, to improve the situation regarding students' mental health, is it the thing that you mentioned before or is there anything else you would like to emphasize? Yeah, I think, you know, the main thing is funding, you know, funding for our higher education institutions, funding to so that then they can support our students and the staff. We mustn't forget the staff in this. They're also under a huge burden on all the things that they have to, to work on, including supporting students. So it's always, always more, more money. Um, and that way you can also afford the counsellors that, that we really, really want. Um, I think it's really hard to decide on one thing, but, you know, Always, always, always more money. <laughs> but uh, one thing to higher education institutions, maybe, what should be their priority in dealing with that topic and those issues? It's making the space available for, for the councillors, working with national policymakers uh, on making sure that they are employing these people, that, you know, they are making sure that their learning environments are intrusive to good mental health and making sure that there's there's spaces for students um to 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 be on campus and be happy on campus and again that they can afford you know the food that is on campus and afford the housing so again it's it, it's really about money obviously different countries have different models on on who who decides all of these things um but it is it's supporting supporting students so yeah basically when when for a higher education institutions it's more about the environment and the services offered for then for the national policy making level it's about the systematic change if we refer back to the charter mental health charter that ESU has published uh, my very last questions um, and one of them is that um, we have talked about your survey the charter but um, these were already some years uh, back uh, but what is ESU's current focus regarding the topic of students mental health are there any new initiatives that you are like working on any any ideas for future that you're dealing with so at the moment like we've responded to again to the eu's um comprehensive approach to mental health and follow really following up on that um this year we're working on our flagship um, publication and next year which is the blonde with student eyes um, it's because next year in the spring all the higher education ministers from across U the european higher education area a meeting for the ministerial conference in Tirana. So there's aspects in that. And the Blonia student eyes is, so every ministry of education has to send in the Bologna implementation report. So it's how they are implementing the different key commitments from the Bologna process. Um, for those of you that aren't as into this as, as I am, um, I'm not an expert either. Um, and so they say this is the state of uh, higher education in our country. This is what we think we're following. And it has all the different aspects from quality 
um, to internationalization or everything. Um, and in we do then we've collected all the data from our national unions saying, well, how do you view it on the different areas? So from the social dimension, which is where mental health comes into and the social dimension of higher education is ensuring that um, the people within higher education are reflective of, of society. And there, there are points on, on counselling. So there'll be all different points related to all of that. And then there's a specific question about counselling. We're, we're just analysing the data at the moment. So really looking forward to, to publishing that in the spring. And then we'll see if we have the capacity maybe one day to, to do a follow-up study. Um, but we're really, really glad that Eurostudent are collecting data. And we hope that as many people as possible are part of that different countries as possible are part of that collection um and then we'll see if we're able to do more more studies like this in, in and, and follow up <laughs> and follow up webinars to share the results and findings yes because the thing is we are a lot of us are doing this on a part-time basis representing students this isn't my full-time job so you know we achieve an awful lot i think as a un as a European Students Union with the limited resources that we have, I think that we've achieved a lot of great things like these these studies. Um, so really appreciate all the work that's that's gone into into them. So that's the future Bologna with student eyes, spring twenty twenty four. Yeah, it is very glad to see that a lot of uh, things are still going on, being planned, and they're all like. Uh, putting their effort into database uh, and uh, really like um, the quality based and quali quality um, policy making because it's all about service and data collection from different countries. Um, to really I, is, I forgot to mention, I think, you know, we get together our students, you know, four times a year and often there there's sessions where, you know, they're sharing good practice, they're sharing what's going on because like I said before, most of the work is being done by our different mem member unions. We are simply supporting them. Um, so they are they're the real workers on the ground that are closer to students um, and what's going on in in individual local areas and higher education institutions. So it's it's about bringing them together as well. Yeah, a lot of work being done and still to be done, but yes. to finish on a hopeful and more cheerful uh, note, uh, Emily, just a question to you in that sense that not, not so formal and not about ESU, what would be your uh, tip to others how to take care of your mental health? Maybe you have any personal um, like way of saying that, ah, I'm doing that, that this works for me. Um, any advice? I think be kind to yourself. So often we we can say unkind words to ourselves, take care of ourselves, that we can take care of, of other people, you know, make sure that, you know, treat yourself to if a nice piece of cake, if that's what you want to do, or treat yourself in the shop, or treat yourself to walk, you know, go outside, do the things that, that bring you joy every day. Find one, li one little thing, uh, you know, and, and try and do that. It doesn't have to cost anything, you know, fight, and everyone's different, you know. Some people like standing in the sea, in, in freezing cold sea and jumping in that. Other people would rather be sitting in front of a fire, you know. It's 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 about you and what, what you can do with your available uh, resources. Um, and just, you know, try and like, when you see people in the street, just smile at them. It, it might confuse them, but it might make their day. It might be the only person that smiled at them um, that day. Um, and when you smile, you you help feel better as well, I think. I don't know. It's hard to give <laughs> advice to it. Um, um, <laughs> I think they're really like, basic, but very at the same time, very important things that we often yeah. somehow... Uh, forget especially when we are busy and uh, there's a lot to do and especially in northern europe when it's november and it's oh, yeah. 
dark and cold outside. So yeah, I think these are all very good recommendations. Thanks, thanks to you for being with us, for sharing all the good ideas, best practices, and what ESO is doing about students' mental health. I'm also very thankful to all our listeners and uh, the materials that have been shared also in the chat and your questions and comments. Uh, what I can announce already is that the next Eurostudent Talks will take place on the 16th of November, and we will be talking about some research findings about study conditions in Luxembourg. And uh, the cherry on top is that uh, in this presentation, there will be some very new visualization techniques being used. So stay tuned either via Twitter or, um, or through our Eurostudent Talks mailing list. And uh, I think we can see you next time. And until then, take care of you and your mental health. Thank you, Emily, and thanks to everyone else. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Marlene. Bye.